make people understand uh, that aerospace is a fairly complicated domain. Uh, having tools is nice, but I think uh, there is more to, more to really achieving end results, uh, positive end results, than what tools alone can do. And uh, Dr. Singh's presentation is, is a good example. You know, starting from scratch, how do you learn about all the various issues? And uh, you have to basically step up uh, to take care of these various things that come up. Uh, what I would like to do is in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, give a, uh, let's see, what am I looking for? Uh, give you a little bit of an overview on uh, some of the work uh, that we do in uh, Boeing. Uh, some of the work that we do in Boeing, uh, originally I thought I was going to uh, talk more about uh, CAE, not only from the point of view of CFD, but also some uh, uh, structures related tools, but then uh, considering how much time we have, uh, I figured I better stick to something that I know a little bit better than uh, and, and stay only with uh, the aerodynamics aspects. Uh, so primarily we're going to talk about aerodynamics, uh, but in a larger context, uh, Dr. Singh's talk was more about a particular program uh, and in Boeing, it's very hard to pick a particular program. We have uh, too many activities uh, that come into the picture, and many of them, of course, uh, involve the use of tools, and, and the knowledge that you build up uh, comes from all the different experiences. So let me walk you through a little bit of a uh, background here. Uh, so some of the things that Dr. Singh mentioned uh, uh, should come up here. You know, you, you have the aircraft design space, and when you look at uh, just the aerodynamics, which is what he said he started with uh, on, the, on the left here, uh, it kind of feels like, okay, maybe my job is done. And then suddenly you find out that uh, uh, the, the structures people come along and say, give me information. Uh, then the uh, systems people come along, and, and his example about the door and the, uh, and the buzz problem, those were in some sense related to the system, and the uh, stability and control also comes into the picture, and, and store separation is somewhat along those lines. Uh, it's okay to have an airplane, but if I drop something from it, uh, what does it do to the airplane? What does it do to this thing that I'm uh, leaving? Uh, so. There are many things that come up as challenges, uh, decision points in the life of the airplane, and, and therefore you, one needs to be, uh, one, have the ability to, to get that kind of data, and then you know, be able to respond to them in a, in a reasonable manner, in a reasonable amount of time, reasonable amount of cost. Just want to give you an example uh, or, or give you, walk you through history here. Each of those stars that are popping up uh, are major, uh, major, uh, I wouldn't say programs, but major milestones in the development of aerospace. Uh, all these airplanes I'm showing you here are from the Boeing uh, uh, company. Uh, I did not even include McDonnell Douglas in there and Rockwell, which are all now part of Boeing. Uh, but basically, this is representative of the history of aviation as it has developed. Uh, if you go look at the, the, the early part, uh, the airplane looks very, very different. The one that says 1915 uh, BMW uh, seaplane, uh, that was actually, uh, the Boeing company officially was incorporated in 1916. So that was the very first airplane that was designed uh, by Bill Boeing and his team. Uh, looks very, very different, and they had no CFD in those days. They had no NASTRA. Uh, so you have to think about at what point in this evolution did these tools come into the picture, and, and the way people think today. You know, people, you know uh, both Mani and uh, Singh talked about uh, the IBM 360. I remember the IBM 360 also. It was a big, big event uh, to be able to go give your deck of cards so that, you know, the the, the machine will come back and say that you have a formatting error on card number seven. And then the whole thing comes to a crashing halt, okay? So uh, it's, it's a very, very different time that we live in today, uh, with, especially with the younger engineers that are in the room. 
Uh, we take a lot of things for granted, and, and I can remember, you know, so can my senior colleagues here, uh, the, the, the evolution of this. Uh, and, and it's very important to remember that the, the, the chart that I showed you earlier about the design, design is not done by CAE. You know, it is computer-aided engineering. So the computer is there to help you. I can say that I used a computer before the IBM 360. It was called the log tables. I don't know how many of you know how to use log tables, but that's what we used. That was our computer. And then we had slide rules. That was also a computer. Maybe, you know, and, and uh, you know, there are other computers that I've used. When, when I was doing my undergraduate uh, uh, thesis, you know, we had a project that we had to do. I spent many hours working on this electronic computer which was made of Nixie tubes. I don't know how many of you know what a Nixie tube is. Anybody, who knows what a Nixie tube is? No? Nobody? Not even you guys? It is a long tube which has numbers in it, and the numbers will light up. So, if, you know, like eight is in front of seven, you know, six is behind that, and that was the thing that would light up. The tube would light up to say if the number is 88, the eight and the eight and the two Nixie tubes would light up. And that was a computer that I used uh, when I was doing my undergraduate project. So the computers have been used, but the computer that we imagine in those days is very, very different from the computer you imagine today. So I thought it'll be interesting to kind of show you this. If you want to do computer aided engineering, you need computers. And the reason computer aided engineering has become so important and popular today is because of this huge event that happened in 1958 called the development of the integrated circuit. That is what enabled the computers to grow. The IBM 360, I you know, show you uh, in 1965, uh, it was a computer that filled up this whole room. Uh, and it probably had, you know, uh, most of, I think probably, you know, most of our laptops can do more than that machine could do, but that took a whole room. And, and, and uh, you, you could see, you know, tapes and people and, you know, you had to, you know, sit inside a uh, completely protected room. Uh, but those were instrumental in making the development of CAE to happen. Because if those didn't, things didn't happen, those developments, in the, in the electronics and computer technology did not go forward. You know, one can sit there and write up all the equations. I remember working with a, uh, one of my colleagues, a professor uh, in, uh, in the early 80s. And, uh, you know, he was very, he was actually had two PhDs, one in the structures area and one in the aerodynamics area. And uh, he was telling me how there are, if you go back to literature, there are people back in the 1800s who had talked about, here is a formulation, a mathematical formulation to solve, you know, aerodynamics problems. And all you have to do is to iterate. You know, you do this, you calculate this, go back and recalculate, and, you know, here's the methodology, but then, you know, sorry, we can't really do it. It's of no real practical use because nobody has the time to sit and do that iteration over and over again. It's impossible to do that. But the concept was there. And that concept, which is what we use in all our computer-aided engineering of, you know, a lot of numerical calculation, a lot of iterative solution, converging the solution to whatever, whether it's in the structures domain or in the aerodynamics domain, comes, be becomes possible because of this technology, which is from the computer. So it's, it's, it's important to put things in context in terms of what we take for granted, where it came from. Uh, I still remember working on the Cray. The Cray uh, 1 was a major, major improvement uh, in the uh, development of, uh, of computational methods, and it enabled people to now look at CFD you know, beyond a NACA 0012 airfoil, go look at something that was more reasonable, more meaningful, to the airplane company, which is already making airplanes long before these things showed up, right? I mean, that's the point I wanted to make. You know, for example, if you look at the 747, which is an iconic airplane, the 747 flew first in 1969, and, and the IBM 360 uh, showed up in 1965. So the 747 was built 
you know, well before the IBM 360 showed up and well before the, the terminology of CFD did not exist in those days. CFD is a term that came into picture more in the late 70s and early 80s. So the, this is like a confluence of, you know, what we refer to as CAE today is a confluence of the mathematical techniques, the numerical methods and so forth, supported by these guys, the computers and, and the electronics uh, capability that develop in order to solve, you know, engineering problems, whether it's in CFD or or structures domain and you know or filling bottles or toothpaste or whatever it might be. Now at Boeing, uh, this is only starting from about 1960 uh, uh, or so, 1980 or so. Uh, prior to that, we primarily used uh, early, very very early on. People used you know intuition, gut feeling, and knowledge that was in their head. You know, people did design, people did a lot of experimenting, you try various things, you crash a few airplanes on the way. Uh, we don't talk about it, but if you really think about it, if you go back and look at the, the history of air, airplane development, uh, the number of people that have given their lives just because we didn't know certain phenomena happened and airplanes basically crashed. That number is huge. Most of those people are sitting in the West or, you know, are buried someplace in the West, you know, U.S. and Europe. Uh, because in those days, people went ahead and developed airplanes. What seemed like a good idea, something is not working, let's make this change. You know, like Dr. Singh was talking about, you know, can I move this back because it's interfering? You know, I'm getting some phenomena. I need to somehow take care of that. So what do you do? There was no CFD. There was no time to go to a, make a model and go to a wind tunnel. So, you know, people get together, the designer makes a, a call, they make a change, then they say, test pilot, okay, now it's your turn to go check it out. And if you are lucky, the test pilot comes back and says it's working. If you are not lucky, the test pilot ever comes back, the airplane is not there either, okay? That's the reality of aviation. Uh, sounds very, you know, and, and compared to those days, I'm talking about 1930s, 1940s, and, you know, even up to probably 50s, uh, where we are today, you know, it's, it's a huge, huge improvement in the way we do business. So prior to 1980, we had panel codes, uh, which, which had already, the computers were uh, somewhat available. Some of the panel code work could be done by hand, uh, by hand calculators. And uh, I recall when I joined McDonnell Douglas, uh, the, the, a few years before that, they eliminated a particular category of, of work, and that category was the runner. You know, there used to be actually people who used to wear, you know, roller skates, and they used to be the runners of data between one department and some other department. And that particular job category was eliminated because the computers had, had come in by that time. And the runner's job was to take instructions from a designer go and give it to the calculation group, which was a you know, large number of people uh, sitting there with you know, mechanical calculators, and they would sit and crank, basically crank out the results, because that's how the mechanical calculators work. You punch the numbers and you turn the crank, and something will happen. So when we say crank out the results, that's what it means. Sit there and crank out the results, and those results are to be sent back to the designer, who is sitting in some place, you know, some other part of the building. So they used to actually have these people running back and forth. I have never actually seen them because they, they were all, you know, uh, let go before I joined the company. But that is, again, the historically what happened. So in the early 80s, uh, we started seeing, you know, there's a NASA line up on the top, and then there's the Boeing Tools line at the, at the bottom there. And basically, NASA started developing certain types of tools. Uh, if you are a history of CFD, you should recognize some of these names. Pan Air is a panel code. Flow 22 was kind of the full potential code, uh, which first came into the picture. Uh, people like uh, Jim Jamison became very, very famous because of the full potential flow code that he developed. Um, and then, you know, as time went on, you, you went on to uh, look at, uh, you know, Cartesian grid that uh, Dr. Uh, Singh mentioned. Uh, TLNS 3D, which is now an Avio Stokes 
formulation, and then there are further you know, versions or variations of the Navier-Stokes formulation that were developed by NASA, NASA scientists, you know, as well as uh, universities that were providing, uh, were doing research funded by NASA. In parallel, Boeing developed its own code. Boeing generally likes to work with our own code because of some of the issues that Dr. Singh mentioned. You know, you need uh, understanding of what this code is telling you. If the code is telling you, you know, he said, if the wind says 15 degrees, it actually means 10 degrees. CFD has the same problem. CFD may say the lift is, you know, 1.23, it actually means something else. And, and what is this difference between the predicted value, calculated value, versus the actual value is something that you learn only from experience. Uh, you can go to any CFD vendor, you can go to you know, the, the people who develop the code, they will have certain experience, they'll tell you something, but is that true for your configuration, in your environment? Nobody knows. That's something that you have to learn. What may be valid for the airplanes that I'm showing you there, those are all commercial airplanes. Uh, they have very different uh, configuration. They, they behave a certain way. You, same rules will not apply for the LCA. LCA is a very different configuration, different kind of animal. So you now have to understand exactly what the expectations are. So as time went on, so between the uh, 1960s, which was the development of the uh, the 767, 757, uh, 737, and so forth. Uh, that was not the very first 737, but there was you know, further improvements on the 737. As we went on, for example, it says, um, I don't know how, how well you can read. Unfortunately, I'm having the same problem that Mr. Dr. Singh was having. The cursor is not moving very well. Uh, the, for the... Uh, 737-200, uh, there was a nacelle installation. Uh, if, if you go to the airport and you, there are many 737s flying around, if you look at the nacelle, the nacelle is not a round thing. It's actually flatter at the bottom. Uh, and that was a design that was done uh, with CFD and verified later uh, to make sure there is sufficient ground clearance, junk from the air, you know, the, the tarmac does not come into the airplane. Uh, later on in the 90s, you see that the, uh, the design was, again, CFD was used uh, as part of the improvement, you know, 21% thicker, uh, but also faster wing. Those were the days when the supercritical wing was very, very popular. Uh, so again, that was CFD played a big role in that. Uh, later on in the early 2000s, uh, you know, mid 90s to 2000, uh, you see uh, further improvements. Uh, to the 737. Again, 737 has been around for a long time, but every, you know, every few years it goes through major modifications based on what we already learned, based on new technology, new analysis capability that you have. And then, of course, the latest version is the 787. Now, at the bottom you see uh, the number of wings tested. Back in the 80s, you know, late 70s and early 80s, uh, we would test something like 50, 60, 70 different wings in order to figure out what is the one that would make sense for the configuration. Now, you look at that in the mid-90s, early to mid-90s, it is down to 10 to 20, and then you look at, uh, you know, 787, there were only six wings that were built and tested. Uh, and, and the difference in this, you know, Dr. Singh talked about, you know, it saves you money, it saves you time. Uh, wind tunnel testing is expensive. Uh, you don't get, you know, slots in the wind tunnel to go and go, you know, to actually do your testing. Uh, and if you want to make minor changes, it's not that easy to do. Uh, so what CFD has enabled us to do is to get considerably increased confidence so that Instead of testing, you know, various configurations, which is how people used to do things before. You know, either you actually test it in real life and you put your, your airplane and the pilot at risk, or you, if you have the time, you go there and actually do the testing in the tunnel. Uh, but many, many, many uh, configurations are involved because you're trying to fine tune. That's why there were so many configurations involved. 
Today you can do a lot of that fine tuning, you know, on paper, you know, with the computer. And then when you, when you have fewer choices, which are much more uh, better developed choices, that is those are the ones that we go test out uh, and then, you know, make your final decision based on that. So, you know, this is basically saying that, yes, you know, you can use CFD to improve your product, uh, and then you are able to increase the, uh, the throughput of the design team. In the 787, this is the, the, the latest version, latest uh, airplane that's been uh, uh, released by Boeing in, in its uh, train of uh, airplanes. Uh, there are several things that were done. Uh, you know, there are, you know, don't, I don't think there's too much importance to the, the font size here. Uh, some are smaller because there are more words there. But uh, basically, even if you go to a wind tunnel, uh, the question comes up, can you believe the wind tunnel fully? If I get, a, get data from the wind tunnel, can I simply take that and, and go with that? Uh, the answer is no, because the wind tunnels have walls around them. They have things that they are, you know, the model is being held on. So you have corrections because of that. The Reynolds number that you can achieve in wind tunnels is not the same as the Reynolds number in flight. So there are corrections uh, you know, connected with that. So there are corrections that are necessary, and what did people do in the olden days? Again, it was, you know, by learning, trial and error, you understand, you know, how the wind tunnel data needs to be mentally adjusted for, you know, in the real life. Whereas today, we can do those kinds of things uh, with CFD. With a CFD code, you can generate data at, say, Reynolds number of 5 million, you can also generate data at Reynolds number of 25 million. You can try to understand what is the difference. That will help you to understand, you know, how do I interpret the data from the wind tunnel. So you cannot blindly say that just because it's experiment, uh, that's fully believable. You know, that has its own limitations in terms of the, the uncertainty in the experiment. Uh, there are uh, uh, many varieties of things that are mentioned here, starting from the nose of the airplane. How do you shape uh, the, the nose, you know, the cab design? Uh, you know, there are, there are requirements in terms of visibility, there are requirements in terms of the, you know, how much drag is introduced there, so, you know, shaping that. Uh, the wing body fairing, you know, the, the wing is, is the, the lifting body primarily, but then, you know, that has to be attached to the fuselage, there's a, there's a uh, engine sitting there, what is going on there? Again, this is not at any one condition. Uh, you know, we don't design the airplane to be perfect when it is cruising, and then, you know, it doesn't matter what it is doing somewhere else. That's not the case. You know, all these things have a huge design space, as you know, and the performance of this vehicle has to be acceptable throughout the design space. So, uh, again, the, the engine airframe integration is another one. Uh, what do you do with the exhaust of the engine? Where does it go? How does it affect the, the passenger comfort? Uh, how does it affect the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the airplane itself? Is it going to go and impinge on some part of the airplane? Uh, they say it's uh, designed for stability and control. Of course, I want to be able to uh, also control the airplane. It's not just, just that it's going to fly. It, it, it has to be maneuverable. Uh, high lift design is a, is a big part. Airplanes have to not only fly in, in cruise condition, but also have to take off and land and high lift is a, is a very critical part. Uh, even though it is short in duration, the, the behavior of the airplane in high lift is very, very important. Uh, similarly, high speed design, given. Um, wing tip design, there's a lot more attention paid to uh, what should the tip of the wing look like. You know, if you go to the airport or you look at pictures, uh, you will see varieties of wing tips uh, that you can see uh, on airplanes nowadays. Uh, you know, the, the 787 doesn't have an obvious looking, um, the, uh, the winglet, uh, it's kind of blended into the wing itself. There is a winglet, but it is blended into the wing itself. You know, it's, it's, it's now questionable whether you really call it a winglet or not. If you go to the 737, uh, the 737-800 has a very, very nicely blended winglet but if you have seen pictures of the 737 MAX, which is the next version of the 737, it has a split winglet. Uh, so, so there are varieties available. Again, people are trying to understand, 
exactly what configurations can I look at. Uh, now, of course, I can, I can play these games with CFD, so that gives you uh, different ways to look at things. So the, the, the point of this chart is, uh, just like uh, Dr. Singh mentioned, yes, there are so many things that can be done with CFD. Uh, that's true even for a commercial airplane. There are many, many questions that can be answered that are routinely addressed today uh, using the CFD tools. Just to, you know, some other things that we already mentioned in a more in pictorial form, uh, chart on the top left basically says between 1980 and today, uh, the occupancy hours, and I, earlier I talked about the number of models that were made, number of internal models. This is referring to how many hours of internal testing was involved, uh, and, and uh, basically there's a significant drop 25%, you know, between 1980 and 1990, and then another 30% from 1990 to the 787. Uh, so significant drop in the number of hours of testing that is done. And again, wind tunnel testing is very, very expensive, uh, not only because of the, the, the power that is required, but also because of the, uh, the instrumentation that is involved, the, the very, very special, uh, specially trained people that are involved. So all those things make, make a, a, a big impact on the, on the overall development cost. Similarly, what we are looking for in the future is that as we get more and more confidence in the CAE techniques, uh, we should be able to uh, speed up the process of the overall development timeline. Now, uh, I, I don't want to go into specifics in terms of how many years or months this might be, uh, but it is safe to say that airplane development takes usually years. And, uh, you know, we are not talking about cell phones here, which, you know, the, the, the company like Samsung and so forth, they come out with a new model every three months. Airplanes, you know, we, 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 it doesn't work that way. You can, you can add a couple of zeros next to that sometimes. So, nevertheless, there is an interest in, you know, shortening this because the, the longer you work on it, the longer the investment, the, the customers are... You know, everybody would like to have the latest thing, you know, right now. They don't want to wait a very, very, very long time. So, like every other industry, we also would like to bring these, uh, you know, make them uh, faster in terms of development time. And that is a promise, I think, that uh, CAE tools, CFD in particular, you know, do offer. Uh, and, and that's kind of what we can look forward to, I think, in, in, in the future. Now... We talked about CFD replacing wind tunnel, uh, but it's not entirely true that, you know, they, I remember, uh, uh, I probably still have in, in, my, in my collection somewhere, stories about uh, how CFD is going to make wind tunnels obsolete. Uh, this was the, uh, you know, messages, uh, somewhat facetious, but messages that used to be made uh, back in the early 80s and so forth. Uh, but what we have found is that wind tunnels are very much alive, they are very much needed. Yes, we probably want to reduce the usage. So we do use the wind tunnel as the primary uh, pre-flight design and validation tool. So even though we do a lot of work on the, on the uh, uh, computer, we still want to go and get some hardware check. We don't want to be surprised. But then what do we do with the CFD? It's a pre-flight design and validation tool. Uh, you know, which is, which is the right way? Do we use the wind tunnel as the, as the one, or do we use the computational tool? The reality is that we use both. Uh, they play a complementary role. It is not that. So if you are a, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people say that, you know, you know, I'm a CFD specialist. You know, other people will come and say, I'm a wind tunnel specialist. Actually, we don't want CFD specialists or wind tunnel specialists. We want aerodynamic specialists. Because if you really want to know aerodynamics, same is true in structures domain and other domains. Uh, we want engineers who understand how these, both these systems work. Because that's the only way you're going to be able to make a contribution. Uh, if you want somebody to press a button on CFD, I don't need to hire engineers. I can train my dog to do that. Uh, you know, a dog will go press the button when it needs to. Okay, or a monkey can do that. Okay, so the reason we need trained engineers is because uh, there is more to these things than, than just the code or the grid and so forth. Uh, just to uh, recap, 
Uh, over the 40 years, I'm showing you two pictures of the 747, uh, the first one that came out in uh, 1969. Uh, Pan Am was actually one of the original customers of the 747-100, and uh, almost you know, 40 plus years later, uh, the, there is a 747-8 that's been, uh, uh, that's been uh, released by the company. And uh, what you basically see is that there is a huge improvement, increase in uh, the amount of air travel, both in terms of passenger traffic and, uh, and freight traffic. Uh, but what has the industry done? I mean, this is not only because of CFD. This is because of CFD plus various other things. Uh, the, the industry has improved the fuel economy. You know, when you say fuel economy has doubled, we, we use half as much fuel to transport, you know, for per passenger mile. Uh, you know, you, you only use half the amount that we were using in uh, 40 years ago. Uh, at the same time, the, the noise footprint is considerably lower. Uh, you know, it has gone from 115 dB to 90 dB, which is like a 75% reduction, really, because of the way the dB scales work. Uh, the pollution is also reduced uh, correspondingly because you're using less fuel. Uh, and then at the same time, we did not compromise on the safety. You know, we're not doing something, you know, putting passengers at risk. Uh, the risk involved, it's, it's, it's generally safer to, uh, to travel on airplanes than it is to drive uh, on Bangalore traffic. So, uh, and, and that's true for Los Angeles traffic or, you know, or Rome traffic or whatever, or London traffic. It's all the same. Airplanes are considerably safer, you know, than other modes of transportation we use, you know, on the ground. And CFD has a big role, you know, in, in, those, in that improvement. Now, I just want to say uh, something that, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I said, you know, SAE, we would like SAE people to participate is, uh, you know, there are many people in India who are supporting uh, other companies, you know, some other logos you see, Rolls-Royce. Uh, you know, is not an Indian company, Siemens. You know, these are all companies that have come to India, so there are engineers in India, you know, working to support them and so forth. Uh, but I think if you, and, and, and many youngsters, you know, I get resumes of people. What's your qualification? I have a BTEC from XYZ University, and I know all these. And what do you know? I know how to run Nastran, I know how to run you know, Patran, I know how to do run the CFD you know, tools, three, four of them. Most of them I don't even recognize, okay? Uh, because you know, like if you rattle off you know, acronyms of CFD codes or, or, or structures analysis codes, it doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, but that's the trend that I see. And, and it seems to be that education or getting yourself educated in engineering means how many codes do you know how to run? And, uh, you know, when I graduated from college, probably true for money, probably true for Dr. Singh, uh, we didn't know any code. What we knew was the physics behind and the thought process behind the engineer. Okay? So these, these tools, software that is available, industry has developed, you know, companies like MSC and, you know, other people have developed wonderful tools. All that is nice. But... Tools don't design airplanes, tools don't design, you know, assembly lines and so forth. Then you have processors. You know, you go to a company, Quest has their own processors, the Adash has their own, Boeing has processors. There is a certain amount of cross-fertilization because of forums like this. We come and share best practices and so forth. They help to some extent so that when, you know, I do CFD in my team, it's, you know, fairly comparable to what Airbus is doing or what somebody else is doing. That helps also. But ultimately, it is the people who make the difference. And when I say people, it is the people who are the engineers who are, who are learning how to use the tools. You know, earlier when I said the, the, the 747-100, it was designed long before CFD came into the picture. It was a pretty darn good airplane. It still is. It's still, you know, that, that version is still being flown by certain, uh, certain countries for certain jobs. Uh, people have done, you know, wonderful things without having fancy tools because they use their fundamental engineering skills. So there is this idea that 
there are two types of knowledge. There is the explicit knowledge that you can get from manuals, from reading textbooks, from attending college and so forth. And then there is this tacit knowledge that you gather based on what you do, how you think about it, you know, your experience, experience of your organization and so forth. And that is extremely important. So if you are a youngster, you know, worrying about, I need to understand how you know, another new code works, uh, forget the code, go, go learn more about the physics. Uh, I think the physics will help you. Because I'm showing you this picture on the right, which is, uh, you know, our blended wing body, which looks nothing like the airplanes that I showed you before. So if you have codes, you have calibrated your codes, and you know exactly how it works for a 777 or a 787 or a 747, how do I take that and apply it to this guy? Or how do I take the knowledge from Boeing and apply it to the LCA? You can't. The only way you can do that is if you have that understanding and know what questions to ask and how to get the answers for those questions. So people are very important. Getting that tacit knowledge, that experience is very important. And it doesn't happen very quickly, by the way. It's not something that I can take a crash course and in three months I'm an expert. Uh, it just takes time. Uh, it takes a lo long time. You know, it's not even time, meaning not three years. It probably takes more like 10 or 15 years. So if you are interested in this journey, hang in there. Be prepared to put in the effort. And you, know, you can contribute uh, to the progress of uh, the industry as we go forward. Are there more things to be done? Yes, there are many things to be done uh, in the CFD arena. Uh, this is a list that was put together uh, by one of my colleagues. Uh, there are things connected with boundary layer transition, better models, uh, you know, better prediction for you know, propulsion integration, uh, shock boundary layer interaction. I mean, that's been a subject that's been discussed since 1980s. Uh, it's still an issue in certain places. Uh, and, and lastly here, multidisciplinary analysis. Uh, it's no longer about, you know, are you a CFD person, aerodynamicist, are you a structures person? Uh, it is more and more about how do you bring all these, you know, different disciplines to work together in order to solve your particular problem. So that understanding, you know, understanding not only from your perspective, but also from the perspective of the other discipline uh, becomes very important. So uh, last chart, uh, yes, CFD has become an important and integral part of what we do at Boeing. Uh, it has certainly affected uh, and benefited us on the industry because of the, uh, the reduced time and so forth. And if we are able to do better, it, it helps our customers. Uh, but there are still you know, many more things to be done, to be learned. Uh, and then while the tools and processes are important, uh, which you know, we should focus on, uh, even more focus needs to be on developing the engineers themselves. Thank you for your time. Are you born to engineer?